Yeah, hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me and today we're going to carry on with our coverage of Napoleonic artillery. We're going to be looking at the more, shall we say, exotic weapons that formed artillery in the Napoleonic period. And I'm going to start off by looking at what's perhaps my favourite, especially when playing Black Powder, and that is rockets. Now, rockets in Western Europe were quite uncommon. They were very common out in the Far East. The Chinese obviously invented them. Uh, I did see the Perry miniatures do a range of Koreans for the Joseon War in the 16th century against the samurai when they invaded the Korean uh, peninsula. And they've got cavalrymen who have got like handheld rocket launchers. They're like, like you just sort of fire with rockets on a stick that they kind of gallop around and fire at people which I, I i'm not really an expert in that period but that is awesome i i, I just want i want a korean army just so i can feel those bad boys so uh they were used quite a lot in the east india was another place where rockets were very popular um in during the siege of sering patam or the storming of sering patam in the war against the tipu sultan uh the fortress there has a sort of a weird like dog leg uh layout so you sort of you go through the main gate and you're in a very long sort of corridor with the outer wall and then an inner wall uh funneling you off to the left uh, and what happened when the british were storming it is they stormed through the gate and the indian troops were on top of the battlements and they would just light a rocket and throw it down into the um into the corridor i guess you could call it below them between the two walls in that enclosed space that was packed with troops, absolutely horrifying. Because the troops were so tightly packed together, the blast wouldn't affect that many people. But it must have been terrible if you know you were you suddenly just saw this rocket landing on you. They're very very similar to firework rockets. If if you think of you know what you know for your Independence Day or your Guy Fawkes celebration or what, how, wherever you use rockets then that's basically what they are. They would be attached to a very long stick and pointed vaguely in the direction of the enemy, lit, and then hopefully they'd fly over to the enemy and explode in the air above them. They had shrapnel-like ammunition, so like we spoke in the last video, uh, for the British and the Indians and other troops, they were more like the shell, so they'd like dig into the ground and explode that way. So the British ones, when they were accurate, they were a lot better. Speaking of those long poles, this is one of my absolute favourite stories of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, the man who brought rockets to the British Army was a, a man called Colonel Congreve. He was a Royal Horse Artillery officer, and he thought they were a great idea. Wellington, mm, not so much. But, um, yeah, Congreve thought they were great, and he designed a troop of Royal Horse Artillerymen who would become the Rocket Troop. And because they had these big long sticks, he decided that it was a really good idea to ha give the issue them with a lance point, which you could kind of screw on to the end of one of these poles to become <laughs> sort of short notice lancers. Now, I've never seen anyone model these, and I've never seen them used in a game, and I don't actually think that they ever used them in combat during the Napoleonic Wars. But... If you want British Royal Horse Artillery uniformed lancers, there you go. That, that's that's where you can get them from. You can have, I guess it will be a tiny regiment in uh, Black Powder of like 20 guys. But, you know, it, it might be quite good fun to have some Royal Horse Artillery uh, lancers. Yeah, well, you know, why not? So Rockets actually underwent quite a big change in the second edition of Black Powder. Um, but the basics of them kind of remain the same. The first, I'd... <clears throat> so Rockets underwent quite a big change in the second edition of Black Powder. Now, <laughs> I'd actually bought one uh, just before the second edition came out, and I use it in a game down at the club against my uh, regular opponent, Andy, and <laughs> it was absolutely crazy. They always only hit on sixes but the number of sixes i was rolling he, he was not happy at all 
But uh, yeah, so they got they got changed. In fact, I got banned from using them after that. So they got changed for the second edition, uh, and they're slightly more random than they used to be. They they were pretty random before, but they're even more crazy random now. The main thing is that if they hit the target, then you need to roll a six to hit them. So if you hit them, they're also disordered, and I think that fits the rockets really well. It means that. They're not necessarily the most effective, it's one dice, but it means that they can disorder the enemy. I would have very much liked to have seen a bonus if you're firing them at cavalry. Maybe make them less accurate, because cavalry are obviously quite fast moving, but maybe disorder them on a 5 or a 6, or some other way of of finding out that uh, they're disordered. I, I think they should be a lot more easy to disorder than they actually are uh but you know i mean rockets are a fairly fringe uh unit i absolutely love the model that warlord games did for it um i'm sure there'll be one in the slideshow of this video uh really cool model they've got like one guy up the ladder who's loading it and then another guy passing him one it's really nice something different i i think it's a great great model so the second exotic type of weapon I want to talk about, it's not really that exotic to be honest, that's the mortar. Now a mortar is exactly what we think of a mortar today. It is very low to the ground and it fires a shell really high up in the air that plunges down upon the enemy. Now be, because of the way mortars were built, they were incredibly squat and they were really, really wide because they were putting out quite a lot of force in a very small length of barrel so they would be incredibly heavy and for that reason they were most often used in sieges either by the attackers to fire over the walls they were quite good for setting fire to towns as were rockets in fact that was what wellington said their sole use was was to scare horses and set fire to towns so two uses there i suppose uh, but the mortars would be used to lob shells over the battlements at the enemy or they would be fired by the defenders from inside the the fort or the city that they were in and he meant that the crews were completely safe there they could fire out over the top and they were in absolutely no danger of being fired at from the back they would usually fire shell like we spoke of in the last video they were designed again to sort of explode above the enemy troops and scatter shrapnel or well, I, I, fragments of iron i don't want to say shrapnel because obviously that's a, a specific thing in the napoleonic wars but the the idea of them was that they could fire from a fairly safe position another use of mortars was at sea uh, perhaps the most famous use of them was a little later than the napoleonic period by the american navy when they were bombarding Tripoli. But you also have it in you know, almost any naval uh, landing. You would have what's called bomb, a bomb catch, which was often a brig or sometimes a sloop of war, but usually a brig because they're a bit more solid. The mortar would you know, be on the foredeck of the ship, fire, and you know, use them to bombard a town. So they were pretty good because they obviously needed to get over the cliffs and the walls and things like that but something which was a an absolute peril of these things. And the second Tim Severin book, I think it's called Corsair, deals with this very well. The main character has been captured by the Ottoman Empire, and he uh, he he's a bit of an engineer, so they put him on one of these uh, bomb catchers. Unfortunately, the force of firing the mortar splits the wood apart on the deck, which obviously makes the whole ship fall apart. He ends up being shipwrecked. So... They they could be almost as dangerous to the user as to the target if they were on board ships. But usually they will be used in fixed positions on land. Uh, you you see a lot of photographs from the American Civil War of mortars. And to be honest, they, they were no different in the Napoleonic period. Very, very rarely used in land battles because they need a static target, really. And they need to be set up to fire from the same position. Uh, but, you know, there they are. If you're interested in using siege games, uh, certainly the Battle of Badahoth 
is a siege game that I would like to do in the near future, then they can be really, really useful for that. But by and large, they were a very specific type of artillery that were used in siege operations. So the last type of unusual artillery that I want to talk about is something that was only really used on ships, and it's called a carronade. So that's C-A-R-R-O-N-A-D-E. And it's a upgrading of something that happened quite a lot on ships. So you used to have in the 18th century something that's called a swivel gun or a deck gun. And that was a sort of a large calibre musket, a very small calibre cannon. Again, it was kind of halfway between the two. That would be used to fire canister or grape shot. And the idea of that was to clear the decks of the enemy uh, marines or sailors. Um, And that's where this carronade really came from. The difference was that they were a lot bigger than these swivel guns. And, I mean, you could have ones that were 18-pounder, 20-pounders. They they were pretty big, but the thing is with them, they were very short and stubby. Now, what that meant is that they didn't have as much weight as a full cannon. So, you could have an 18-pounder carronade, but that would maybe weigh the same as a 12-pounder. It meant that the cannon wasn't very accurate, though, and it also meant that you couldn't put that much powder in there. So they were very, very short-range, heavy guns. So they're quite an interesting one. The British uh, used them. Uh, The Americans adopted them later, but it was mainly a British weapon. And it really went with our Napoleonic tactics of being super, super aggressive. Uh, The Battle of Trafalgar being perhaps the most famous example, where we basically just sailed straight at the Franco-Spanish fleet. We didn't mess about trying to lay on broadsides or anything like that. We just sailed straight up to them and what's known as cross the T. So we sailed in between their ships. Crews would be running from one side of the hull to the other. They'd fire off a broadside to the port side, which is the left. Then they'd all run to the starboard, or the right-hand side of the ship, and then they'd fire at the uh, the ship to that side of them as well. It was absolutely crazy. It was almost unheard of. Crossing the T was, was what you would try and do. But you would very rarely do it as your main battle plan from the beginning with your entire fleet. But hey, that's why Nelson was was a military genius to the extent that Napoleon or Wellington were. So the carronade, very, very short range. We're talking 50 metres, 100 metres maybe, but very, very powerful. You could put quite a lot of grape in there. You could put a big heavy cannonball in there. They didn't usually fire chain shot or bar shot because that wasn't really their role. If you remember from the last video, they were more designed to take down rigging. A carronade was a heavy gun designed to punch through the hull of the enemy ship, or to just go across the deck with the grape shot and just mow down as many people as possible. Going back to the swivel gun, that was sometimes moved up onto the what's known as the gallants or the tops, and that would be you know, sort of the crow's nest, for want of a better term, the top of the masts, and you'd be able to fire those down onto the deck. Not not hugely common, but it was occasionally used. Um, but yes, no, they were largely replaced by carronades, which were, could just put out so much more firepower. It also meant that you know a ship like a a brig or a sloop that could maybe carry a dozen guns could suddenly be upgunned to eighteen of these carronades. So you know again. I, like I said in the last artillery video, I'm absolutely no physicist, but it, to do with like the weight that the ship can carry and things like that means that you could just get more bang for your buck on there, and it means that you know when you're maybe a sixth rate or a fifth rate ship, and you see oh well there's a brig over there that should be nice easy pickings, when you get close to them and they suddenly open up with this huge volume of fire, you know, then you might regret that decision. So those are the three different types of more exotic cannons that I want to talk about, or well, cannons artillery uh, that I want to talk about in this video. Um, And don't forget that I'm doing the prize draw for the Osprey campaign book. It's running till the end of the month, so I'll be doing the draw on the 1st of April, April Fool's Day. It seems very fitting for me, I think. And um, so please go over to that video, comment in the comments if you haven't already. Please share it around or share this video as well. I hope you enjoyed this little two-part series on Napoleonic Artillery. I will see you next time. Goodbye.